The poor pastry boy that invented L'Oreal Paris. Welcome to our chin. In the realm of beauty and cosmetics, there is a name that resonates with elegance and sophistication, L'Oreal Paris. But what if we told you that this renowned brand was born from the dreams of a poor pastry boy? In this video, we invite you to join us in the amazing story of the poor pastry boy who started a revolution in the cosmetics industry and developed the enduring company known as L'Oreal Paris. In the latter half of the 19th century, Eugene Schuler was born into a family of Parisian pastry shop owners. Despite his humble beginnings, he possessed an extraordinary work ethic and academic prowess. Each day, before attending school where he consistently excelled in his studies, he would assist his parents in preparing pastries. Little did he know that this seemingly ordinary start would be the foundation for an extraordinary journey of wealth and success. After completing his baccalaureate degree, equivalent to two years of college, Eugene enrolled in the Institute of Applied Chemistry. His self-assured nature led him to proclaim, I succeeded brilliantly and finished first in my class. Upon graduating in 1904, he secured a position as a laboratory assistant at the esteemed Sorbonne. While it seemed to offer a respectable yet modest future as a university researcher, fate had something else in store for him. A turning point arrived, one that would forever alter the trajectory of Eugene's life. A barbershop owner approached Eugene Schuler with a unique request to help develop a synthetic hair dye. During that time, hair dyes were not widely used by Frenchwomen due to their toxic nature and scalp irritation caused by lead-based formulations. Although Schuler initially agreed to be the barber's technical advisor, he soon realized his desire for independence and decided to venture out on his own. Renting a space near the Tuileries Gardens, he began experimenting with hair dyes, driven by his ambition and determination. His early attempts proved underwhelming, but Schuler persevered. He continued his experiments, altering formulas and even testing the dyes on his own hair. Eventually, his hard work paid off, and he proudly wrote, Finally, I had the good fortune, which I think I deserved, to obtain a product of excellent quality that allowed me at last to launch my company. In 1909, he established the Societe Francaise de Tainture's Inoffensives Pour Chevy, which translates to the French company of inoffensive hair dyes. However, Schuler later changed the name to L'Oreal, a clever play on words that combined Oreo, a popular hairstyle of the time, with Oreo, meaning halo. Little did he know that this small business would eventually blossom into the world's largest cosmetics firm, solidifying his place in history. Schuler was an industrious and inquisitive individual, constantly seeking new avenues to occupy his mind beyond running his company. He delved into various ideologies and philosophies, demonstrating his restless nature. Initially, he explored socialist ideas before immersing himself briefly in Freemasonry, a secretive intellectual cult. However, he eventually distanced himself from Freemasonry, aligning his opposition with Jews and republicanism. During the mid-1930s, amidst the challenging backdrop of the Great Depression, Schuler began sharing his evolving economic theories through books, articles, radio discussions, and public lectures. His primary concept was the notion of a proportional salary. Instead of the conventional hourly or daily wage, he advocated for workers' compensation to be directly proportionate to their level of productivity. Schuler even implemented aspects of this principle within El Oriol's operations, gaining some recognition from economists. However, despite some attention, his scheme did not gain widespread support. Meanwhile, France's parliamentary regime, the Third Republic, was on the brink of collapse following Napoleon III's downfall in 1871. The country was grappling with strikes, militant syndicalism, unemployment, and political turmoil. In this context, the leftist Front Populaire, led by socialist Leon Blum, secured a parliamentary majority in 1936 and embarked on significant reforms. These included implementing a five-day workweek, introducing graduated wage increases, nationalizing the railroads and the Bank de France, and providing two-week paid vacations for all workers. The introduction of paid vacations had a significant impact on Schuler's business. Suddenly, people from all economic backgrounds in France flocked to the beaches and indulged in sunbathing. This surge in vacationers proved to be excellent for Schuler's company. Sales of Amber Solaire, L'Oreal recently launched sunscreen product, experienced a tremendous surge. However, despite the positive impact on his business, Schuler held a negative view of the new leftist policies. 
he had little regard for democracy, believing it only resulted in the ascent of incompetent individuals to power. Moreover, the fact that the Front Populaire government was led by a socialist Jew did not improve his opinion of it. In the politically charged atmosphere of the 1930s, numerous far-right groups emerged in France, and perhaps none were more extreme than La Cagle, meaning the hood. This organization, which held anti-communist, anti-republican, and anti-Semitic beliefs, aimed to replace the Third Republic with a dictatorship modeled after Germany, Italy, or Spain. Charismatic Kaggle leader Eugene Delanco, drawn to Schuller's ideas and undoubtedly enticed by his substantial resources, recruited him as a member of the group. Schuller provided financial support and allocated space for the Kaggle within L'Oreal's offices. While there is no concrete evidence linking Schuller directly to the Kaggle's violent plots, the organization he supported and financed was involved in various nefarious activities. These included assassinations, the bombing of the French Employers Association, and even an unsuccessful coup attempt in November 1937. In Schuller's eyes, he remained a devoted French patriot, but he couldn't help but admire the authority, order, and efficiency that prevailed in Germany and Italy when he looked at their examples. Schuller and his fellow Cagoulards, as they were commonly referred to, had the opportunity to witness firsthand the order established by the Germans. In the spring of 1940, the armored divisions of the Wehrmacht bypassed France's supposedly impenetrable Maginot Line and invaded Belgium. The Blitzkrieg then swiftly advanced into France, with Paris falling without resistance on June 14. The humiliating defeat of the French armies in 1940 brought about a national crisis and strengthened the view held by those like Schuller that democratic administration had failed. Schuller's publications and speeches during the occupation period had a more overtly pro-Nazi and anti-Republican stance. He wrote in his 1941 book La Revolution de l'Economie, I am perfectly aware that we do not have the opportunity that the Nazis had when they came to power in 1933. We don't possess the Germans' charisma. We don't have National Socialism's faith. A dynamic leader like Hitler, who moved the globe ahead, is not present in our day. In another section of the same book, which was part of a collection that also featured Hitler's speeches, Schuller expressed his belief that it was necessary to eradicate from people's minds the naive notions of liberty, equality, and even fraternity, as he believed they would only lead to disastrous outcomes. Following the German triumph, Delanco's Kagel operated openly under the approval of the Nazi occupiers and the collaborationist Vichy government. During the group's convention in June 1941, and do you guys know, Schuller made a shocking declaration, none of these peaceful revolutions can occur without a prior preliminary revolution. Characterized by purification and rejuvenation, and this revolution can only be violent. It will simply involve the swift execution of 50 or 100 influential figures. He disseminated similar ideas along with his economic theories. Through broadcast on the French radio controlled by the Germans, Schuller also had connections with the infamous German official Helmut Nachen, who served as the commander of police and security for the SS intelligence service. Nachen played an active role in the deportation of French Jews to Nazi death camps and was responsible for the execution of numerous French resistance members and civilian hostages. During interrogations conducted by French intelligence services after the war, Nachin included Schuller among his willing collaborators. In 1947, French investigators discovered a list containing the names of 45 agents of Nachin, including E. Schuller, businessman. He aimed to secure the position of Minister of the National Economy within the Vichy government, Nachin revealed during his interrogations. While Schuller never achieved that coveted role, he was identified as the future Minister of National and Imperial Production on a list compiled by Nachin in 1941. Significantly, Schuller played a crucial role in establishing a partnership between Valentine, a prominent paint and varnish manufacturer where Schuller held a co-director position, and the German company Druckfarben. Archived documents, including an internal journal spanning from 1941 to 1944, indicate that up to 95% of the company's wartime output was supplied to the German Navy. Under the Reich's paint plan, Valentine was listed as a top-tier paint supplier since 1941. Gerhard Schmelinski, a German businessman involved in the partnership, was closely associated with the Nazis' Aryanization program, which aimed to confiscate businesses and assets from Jewish owners. 
Schmelinski and Schuler worked closely together, with Schmelinski praising Schuler as a fervent advocate of the Franco-German alliance. Due to his connections with the Germans, according to French historian Annie Lacroix Riz, Schuler significantly increased his wealth during the war. His tax returns from the period reveal a nearly tenfold rise in his personal net income, from 248,791 francs in 1940 to 2,347,957 francs in 1943. Meanwhile, L'Oreal's sales nearly quadrupled between 1940 and 1944. However, Schuler would soon come to regret his questionable statements and political affiliations as the German occupiers withdrew from the country in the face of advancing Allied armies in 1944. Their departure triggered a violent wave of reprisals known as the Epuration, during which resistance groups executed suspected collaborators without proper trials. Shortly thereafter, special courts were established to ensure due process while handing out sentences. At the end of the war, Eugene Schuler found himself caught in the crossfire when a dissatisfied former employee reported him as a collaborator to an official investigative body examining wartime activities of businesses. On November 6, 1946, the committee imposed professional sanctions on him for supporting the enemy's agenda through his public conduct during the occupation. His case was then referred to the Court of Justice of the Department of the Seine, where he faced formal charges of economic and political collaboration. Despite an investigation revealing relatively low levels of wartime sales to the Germans, Eugene Schuler, the founder of L'Oreal, escaped a conviction for economic collaboration. Judge Marcel Gagne determined that the percentage of German business and the nature of the delivered goods did not warrant a conviction. However, the significant increase in L'Oreal's sales during the war remains unexplained. Schuler's political collaboration was also partially obscured, with the judge acknowledging his support for Franco-German collaboration and funding of Delonco's Kagel, but Schuler denying membership in the group. He presented witnesses who testified to his protection of Jewish employees, assistance to resistance members, and secret financing of the resistance. Ultimately, Judge Gagne recommended dropping all charges, allowing Schuler to retain control of his businesses and avoid potential consequences such as removal, disgrace, imprisonment, or nationalization. Today, L'Oreal is a global brand that is recognized and respected by millions of people around the world, and its success is a testament to the legacy of its founder. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more great content.